In this section, we're going to talk about diodes, a very important electronic component. We'll discuss how diodes work, the simplified IV curve for a diode, we will talk about the different types of diodes, and finally, we'll discuss the applications of diodes. Diodes are another type of component that is incredibly important in electronics. It is fundamentally a component with two terminals. As we can see in the picture here, there are two terminals for the diode. Another characteristic of the diode is that the diode is a non-linear component, and this is the first non-linear component that we encounter, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later. Application of the diode are countless. Diodes are used for rectification, for clamping, reverse polarity protections, and many, many, many other applications, and we will see some of them in this section. And finally, it's important to know that there are different types of diodes, each of them tailored for slightly different applications. For example, we have, we start from classic diodes, like the one on the top in this picture, and then we can have Zener diode, which is another type of diode. Then we have LEDs, which are diodes that are able to emit light, as shown in this picture here, the two at the bottom, we have two LEDs, one orange and one red. In addition to be able to emit light, there are also type of diodes that can be used to detect the presence of light, and those are called photodiodes. The drawing in this slide represents the schematic symbol of the diode. This is the symbol. As you can see, it's composed by a triangle that connects to, to a line here. The symbol is obviously not symmetric, uh, differently from the resistor symbol, for example. Here we have two distinct terminals. One terminal, the one directly connected to the triangle, is called anode, and it's usually indicated with A. The other terminal instead is called cathode, and is usually indicated with K. Given the diodes are not symmetric component, it's important for the designer to be able to distinguish between the cathode and the anode. Diodes come in different packages and different sizes, so depending on the package, the manufacturer will find a different way to help the designers distinguish between the two terminals. In the case represented in this slide, this is a pretty big through wall diode, and the way the cathode is indicated is by the means of this gray band. On the image, I also indicated the current with ID and the voltage with VT. Now, looking at the symbol of the diode, you can very easily notice that the symbol looks very, very similar to an arrow. It looks very, very similar to something like this. That is intentional, and it's meant to tell you, to remind you how the component works. We haven't seen that yet exactly, but I can give you a preview. What the symbol is trying to tell you is that the diode is a component that allows the current to flow only in one direction. So the direction of the current is obviously the one indicated by the arrow of the symbol, and it's also the one indicated here. So the diode is a component that in the vast majority of cases, in particular for standard diodes, allow the flow of the current only in one direction. And the direction of the current is from anode to cathode. In order to understand how diodes work, we need to look at their IV curve. The IV curve for a component represents the relationship between the voltage applied to the component and the current that flows through it. Before we continue the study of the diode's IV curve, let's look at the IV curve of a resistor. The IV curve of a resistor is a straight line passing from the origin of the graph, here, where both the voltage and the current are equal to zero. The slope of the curve, which you can indicate this way, indicating the angle between the horizontal axis and the curve, represents the resistance of the component. A resistor with a lower resistance will be represented by a straight line passing from the origin that has a higher slope, like this, for example. So this is for smaller resistance. This is intuitive, as smaller resistors require larger currents for the same applied voltage. The IV curve for a resistor is simply a representation of the Ohm's law for the component. The Ohm's law for a resistor is I is equal to V divided by R. 
and this curve is simply representing this equation. The IV curve is a tool that allows you to find the value of the current for a given voltage. Here's how. Say you have applied a certain voltage Vx to this resistance R. So Vx is here on the horizontal axis. And wonder what is the current that flows through the component. Well, you can solve the problem in two ways. The first way is to use Ohm's law. This is probably the easiest way in this case, because Ohm's law is such a simple equation. So Ix, which is the current going through this resistor, will be simply equal to Vx divided by R. And this is probably what 99% of the people will do. Another way is to use the IV curve. From the value of Vx on the horizontal axis, you draw a vertical line till you meet the IV curve. For example, we can represent it like a, with a dashed line. Then you find what is called the operating point on the curve. And then you draw an horizontal line till you meet the axis of the current. This is the value of the current Ix that you are looking for. Note that the IV curve for a resistor is set to be linear because if you, for example, now decide to take a value of a voltage that is equal to half Vx, your current will also become half. Before moving on to the study of the diode's IV curve, it's important to highlight how every IV curve chart should always indicate how the voltage and the current were measured on a component. In this slide, I indicate that by adding a little sketch on the top left corner of the IV chart. Note that this is really important because if I decided, for example, to measure the currents in a different way and to consider as positive the currents going in this direction, the IV curve would have changed. And instead of looking the way it is now on the slide, it would have flipped around the horizontal axis. So it would have gone from this way to this way. Let's now look at the IV curve for the diode. First of all, let's look how the voltage and the current are measured for this component. You can see from this little graph that V will have a positive value when the anode as an higher potential than the cathode, like this. Furthermore, you can see that the current is considered positive when it flows from the anode to the cathode. So this is really important to be able to understand what's going on in the IV curve. By looking at the curve, first off, we can immediately say that this is not a linear curve. Linear relationship and curves are always represented by straight lines. And this is everything but a straight line. So this component is not a linear component. Secondly, in order to study the curve better, we can split the graph in three different sections. The first and probably most important region, it's called forward region, and it's characterized by a voltage V that is equal to zero or larger than zero. So all this region is the forward region. And the diode, when it's operating in this region, is said to have a forward bias. The second region is called reverse. And the diode is said to have a reverse bias. In this region, the voltage is negative from zero volt up to, in this case, for this specific model of diode that I picked, that is the 1N4148, just an example. All the voltages from 0 to minus 75 volts. Minus 75 volt is called reverse voltage of the component. And finally, the last region is the breakdown region. Breakdown. In the breakdown region, the voltages are negative and higher than 75 volts. So for all voltages negative and higher than 75 volt, we are in the breakdown region. Let's look at the three regions of operation more closely. Let's start with the forward region. 
So in the former region, as you can see here, the current is quite low for voltages lower than 0.7 in this case. But then it grows really, really fast exponentially for voltages higher than 0.7 volt. This 0.7 volt is called forward voltage, but it's also referred as V diode or threshold voltage. You can see how this voltage behaves like a threshold for the diode. Any voltage lower than the threshold will keep the diode off, while as soon as the current becomes even slightly higher, a large amount of current is allowed to pass. You can think as the diode in this region as a voltage control switch. If the voltage applied to the diode is lower than the threshold, the diode is like an open switch. But as soon as the voltage reaches the threshold and goes beyond the threshold, the diode becomes similar to a closed switch. In the reverse region, voltages are pretty high. They go from 0 to minus 75, much higher than 0.7, 1 volt, 2 volts that we have in the forward region. However, even if we have such a high negative voltage, the diode does not allow the passage of the current and only a very tiny negative current is allowed to pass. Note that this current is really low, this graph is not to scale, but you can see that the negative part of the vertical axis says that this, the current at this point is 0.1 microamp. That means that the negative current that is flowing in the reverse region is in the order of less than one microamp, which is practically zero for most applications. If the negative voltage keeps increasing beyond the reverse voltage of the diode, which is minus 75 in this case, so if we enter in this region, the diode will enter into the breakdown region. Now in the breakdown region, a large negative current is allowed to flow. Normal diodes are not designed to work in the breakdown region, hence they will break. The reason for the failure is thermal. At this point in the curve, for example, you have at the same time a very high current and a very high voltage. The product of voltage and current is the power dissipated by the device, and with a high dissipated power, the temperature of the device will increase really fast and eventually will fail. Thankfully, for most applications, the value of the reverse voltage is so high that you really don't need to worry about it. If you have a device that is operated by a battery, you have a much lower voltage. So in order to get to minus 75, you really have to do something special. There are some circuits that can bring the voltage to negative values that are pretty high, but in most of the cases, you will not have to worry about it. It's important to note that while normal diodes will break in the breakdown region, there are some type of diodes, like the Zener diode, that are designed to operate in this region, and we'll talk about them later. In the previous lesson, we analyzed the IV curve for a diode. We have seen that the curve is not as simple as the one of a resistor, and it is convenient to study it by separating it in three different regions of operation. The forward region, the reverse region, and finally the breakdown region. While simulation softwares can easily solve circuits with diodes using real IV curve, the relationship between voltage and current is still too complicated to be handled by hand. Furthermore, it's not necessary for the vast majority of the circuits. In this lesson, we will see how the diode IV curve can be simplified to make possible to solve circuits with diode by hand. In this chart, we represent in blue the original real IV curve for the diode, and in red the equivalent simplified curve. As you can see, we've gone from the real curve to the simplified one by doing two things. Number one, all the parts of the curve where the current was either rising or falling fast with the voltage have been replaced with a vertical line. For example, here and here, you can see that the simplified model uses a vertical line. And number two, all the parts where the current was really low have been replaced with a current equal to zero. As you can see here in this region, in the reverse region of operation, and here in the forward region of operation. Just like we did before, we can split the simplified diode IV curve in three different regions. Because the IV curve has changed, 
we can now define three new, slightly different and more convenient regions of operation. The first is the ON region, which is defined for all voltages equal or higher than the threshold voltage of the diode. So for V equal or higher than the threshold. The OFF region is the region in which the current is equal to zero, which goes from the reverse voltage, which is minus 75 in this case, up to the threshold voltage, 0 0.7 volt. So the OFF region is this one. And finally, we have the breakdown region for negative voltages higher than VR. So this direction here, which is the only region where the current becomes negative. This is a much easier curve to study because, as we will see next, we can substitute the diode in each of its region of operation with a much easier equivalent circuit. Finding an equivalent circuit for a diode in the OFF region is very simple. The OFF region is this region where the current is always equal to zero. We can see that here in this region, no matter what is the voltage across the device, we always have zero current. So the best way to represent this region with an equivalent circuit is to use an open switch. In an open switch, there is no path for electrons to flow, so the current has to be zero, no matter what is the value of the voltage across the switch. In fact, the IV curve for a switch will be something like this. Current and voltage here. This will be the IV curve for an open switch, where no matter what is the voltage across it, the current always has to be zero. Naturally, in this case, this approximation is only valid when the diode is off. It's not valid in the other two regions of operation. Let's now look at what happens when the diode is in the ON region of operation. This is the ON region of operation. We can see that the voltage is always equal to 0.7 volt and the current is positive. The best approximation of a diode is in the ON region is a closed switch in series to a voltage source. So here you have a voltage source, and here we have a closed switch. Now, because an ideal closed switch is indistinguishable from just a wire, we can further simplify this model and remove the switch and just leave only the voltage source. The value of the voltage source is equivalent to the threshold of the diode which in this case is 0.7 volt. Let's try to understand why this model is correct. An ideal voltage source, like an ideal battery, is a device that, no matter what is the current flowing through it, is characterized by a constant voltage. So if we represent the IV curve for an ideal voltage source equal to 0.7 volt, that's what it will look like. Just a straight vertical line crossing the horizontal axis at 0.7 volt. This is very similar to how the IV curve for a diode looks in the ON region. The only difference that one has to keep in mind is that while the voltage source allows for both positive and also negative currents, in the diode we don't have negative currents when the diode is on, but only positive currents. So only currents flowing from the anode to the cathode is allowed. Another interesting thing that is worth highlighting is that the simplified model of the IV curve does not allow for any voltage across the diode that is either higher than 0.7 or lower than minus 75 volt. As you can see, there is no corresponding point in the curve for any voltage higher than 0.7 or lower than minus 75. This is an oversimplification because, as you can see, the real IV curve keeps going for higher voltages and for lower voltages. But this simplified model is good for most applications. The circuit used to approximate the diode 
when it's in the breakdown region is very similar to the one used for the on region. The breakdown region is this one. The voltage is always equal to minus 75 volt and the current is negative. So the equivalent circuit is the following. Again, we have a closed switch in series to a voltage source. If we neglect the presence of the closed switch, we can just replace the diode with a voltage source equal to minus 75 volts. Just as in the case as the diode in the own region, this model is only valid for negative currents, which is currents going from the cathode to the anode. This model is not comparable with the positive current, as one can easily see from the simplified AV curve, there is no positive current in the breakdown region, but only negative values of the current. In this lesson, we're going to talk about an hydraulic equivalent for the diode. Just as in the case of the resistor and the capacitor, for example, the equivalent model is meant to help providing an intuitive understanding of how the component work, but it's not an accurate representation of its operation from my point of view. The behavior of a standard diode can be represented by a one-way gate. As you can see in this sketch, the one-way gate is composed by a gate flap, a hinge, and a flap stopper. The flap stopper prevents the flap from swinging open towards the left, but it can only open towards the right. Down here, I indicated the symbol of the diode, and you can see how it maps with its hydraulic equivalent. And you can see that the anode is on the left and the cathode on the right. Let's see how the hydraulic model of the diode can be used to represent the component. Let's start with the example on the left side of the slide. If a voltage is applied to the diode in this way, which is with a higher potential at the cathode compared with the anode, we know that the current will be above zero, we can call it zero, and we know the diode is in the off region of operation. Let's see what happens with the hydraulic equivalent. Well, we know that higher voltage is represented in the hydraulic world with a higher pressure of the water. So if you are having higher pressure on the right side of this gate, the gate will be shut closed and no water flow will be allowed. This example represents the simplified IV curve of the diode in this region. So it represented for all the points where the voltage is negative up to the breakdown region. How can we explain the behavior of the component in the breakdown region? Well, you can imagine that if the pressure on the right of the gate is high enough, eventually the gate will be broken open and water will be allowed to pass but the component would have been damaged. On the other hand, we know that if we apply a potential that is higher at the anode compared to the cathode, it is possible to have a current higher than zero through the diode if the voltage difference between anode and cathode is large enough and higher than the threshold. It is easy to explain the behavior of the diode using the hydraulic example if the pressure of the water is higher on the left compared to the right, we will have a positive net force pushing the gate flap from the left to the right, hence the gate will open and the current will be allowed to flow. This example represents the simplified AV curve of a diode in the on region, here. If you imagine that the gate flap takes a certain amount of force to open, you can see how the model can be used to represent this region as well. Where the pressure is higher on the left compared to the right, but it's still not quite high enough to open the gate. In this lesson, we will study a few circuits with diode to understand how to use the IV curve we have just learned in practice. The challenge with studying circuits with diode is that Differently than with resistors, capacitors, and other components, diodes are non-linear components and they behave in a different way depending on the region of operation they are in. Let's look at one example. On the left, you can see what looks like the simple possible circuit with diodes. 
a voltage source, like a battery for example, connect it to a diode. I indicated the voltage of the voltage source as VCC. This is a quite common. And then I indicated the voltage on the diode as VD. And then we have, of course, the current through the diode that I call ID. We will see how this circuit is really not that trivial at all. In the center of the screen, I represented the IV curve for this diode and I indicated its threshold and reverse voltage. I assume that these voltages are 1 volt and 100 volts respectively and they are indicated here. On the right there is a table that we are going to fill for different values of the supply voltage VCC. Solving this circuit, which is finding V diode and I diode for each VCC, seems simple. The only thing one has to do is to use the IV curve for the diode. The first step is easy. If we look at the circuit, we recognize that because the voltage source and the diode are in parallel, the voltage on the diode will have to be the same as the voltage on the voltage source. So filling up the first column here is rather simple. I'm just going ahead, minus 10, 0, 0 0.5, 1, 10, minus 150. And of course here I indicate the unit of measurement, so we are talking about volts for VCC, volts for VD, and amps for ID. Now let's go ahead and solve the circuit for the current in the diode. The first points are simple. For voltage equal to minus 10 volts on the diode, that means that on the IV curve will be somewhere here, and we can immediately see that the current is equal to zero. For a voltage equal to zero, we are here, the current is also zero. For voltage equal to 0 0.5, we are here because the threshold is one, so we are halfway between the zero and the threshold, so we have a zero current. The last three points of the table are the most difficult to calculate. Let's start with the first. For VCC equal to 1, V diode is also equal to 1. 1 volt is the threshold of the diode, so we know that the diode will be on and conducting some current. Unfortunately, the simplified IV curve does not help with finding the value of the current, because there is more than one point corresponding to V diode equal to 1, as you can see here. We could pick this point, this point, this point, this point, or this point. There is an infinite amount of points that we could pick. This is one rare example where the simplified IV curve for the diodes
a simplified chart if it cannot be used in some conditions. First of all, it's important to highlight that all simplified models are only valid in a limited region of operation. This is the compromise you have to make for having reduced complexity. It's the engineer's role to make sure that all the models that he or she is using are valid. As far as the data is concerned, this example, while seemingly simple, is actually extremely rare. Diodes are almost never connected in parallel to a voltage source. The reason for that is simple. If you take two diodes of the same model, same part number, same vendor, and even if you buy them in the same shop, their IV curve will be different. There is no way it could be exactly the same. This is true for any component. However, in the case of the dial, the IV curve is so steep that if you try to get to a precise current by setting the dial voltage, you will have a very large error between different devices. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a diode and the real IV curve looks like this. Now you have a second diode, you build a second circuit with another diode, same part number, same model. But these other diodes have an IV curve that looks like this. They are very similar to each other, they just have a slightly different threshold voltage. They could also have a different slope, they could have quite a few differences. However, let's just assume that they only have a difference in threshold voltage. Now, if you try to set a precise current through the diode by setting the voltage here, for example, it's easy to see how you will have big difference in current between the two diodes. The first diode will have this value of the current. The second diode will have this value of the current. So you can see how the second diode will have more than twice as much the current of the first diode while in theory you expect them to have exactly the same current. It's common to say that diodes are not controlled with voltage, but they are controlled with current, and we will see an example of that in the next lesson. In this lesson, we will see what is the behavior of the diode when its current is controlled externally. In the circle on the left, I've replaced the voltage source with the current source. An ideal current source is a device that, no matter what is the voltage at its extremity, it always provides the same current. So if you want to represent the IV curve for a current source that generates, say, 1 amp, that's how it will look like. Current, voltage, just an horizontal line crossing the vertical axis at 1 amp meaning that no matter what is the voltage, the current will be always the same. Just like with the voltage source, different symbols can be used to represent the current source. In this symbol here, we have two circles and then we have a arrow to indicate the direction of a positive current. Another way to represent the current source is the following, like this. I tend to like the first better. The current source is an idealized device. There is no simple equivalent component like the battery is for an ideal voltage source. But you can generate an equivalent current source by using a professional voltage supply. This scenario is simply meant to represent what happens when your external circuit forces a certain current into the diode rather than a voltage. We will see a more realistic example of this in the next lesson, but this is a good place to start. This time, the current is the input of the exercise, so I indicated here different value of the ID current, the current in the diode. I changed the unit of measurement to milliamp, which is more realistic. The other thing that we don't have to worry about is VCC, which is how I call the voltage across the current source, because as we already seen in a previous lesson, it's the same as VD, so we don't need to calculate, so we can probably just write equal to VD. That's it. One thing that we can note immediately is that, differently than with the voltage, the IV curve has point for any value of the current that we want, because here the graph will continue, and also in this direction. 
Let's start the analysis. Let's start with the first point here, minus 10 milliamp. Because the current is negative, that means that we have a 10 milliamp current going in the opposite direction of the arrow of the current source, which means that the current is going in this direction from the cathode to the anode of the diode. That means that the diode has to be in the breakdown region. Now, we don't know where 10 milliamp is in this scale, minus 10 milliamp. We can say that it's probably here, which will mean that the voltage across the diode is minus 100 volt, which is the reverse voltage of the diode. Same results for minus 5 milliamp, which would be somewhere here. We get the same voltage, minus 100. Note that in reality, the voltage will be different between these two points. For example, if we represent the IV curve, the real one, it could be something like this. So one point will be here and the other will be here. So as you can see, there is a little difference between them. But this difference can be neglected in most applications. In particular, if you consider that we are working around 100 volts here. So even if this difference ends up being a volt, is still neglectable in most cases. Let's keep the case with the 0 milliamp and let's go to the positive currents. Now, because the current is positive, that means it is going in the same direction as indicated by the current source. So it's a current going from anode to cathode, which means that the diode is on. If the diode is on, as we can see here, any positive current will always have the same voltage in the simplified IV curve which is the threshold voltage, which is one volt. So we have one, one, and one, no matter what is the value of the current. We can make the same argument here that we did for the breakdown region. The fact that in reality, the voltage is slowly increasing with the current. But again, unless you're designing a precise analog uh, circuits where the precise voltage across the diode matters, you can neglect this difference. Finally, let's look at the current equal to zero. What happens in this point? In this case, the diode is off because the current is zero and the voltage is undetermined as it could be anywhere between minus 100 and one volt accordingly to this uh, IV curve. Let me cancel here. If you look at this IV curve, we have zero current in this whole region. So that means that the voltage could be anywhere between minus VR and the threshold. While this limitation might seem as big as the one we encountered in the previous lesson, there are two important differences. The first is that the diode is off, hence it behaves like an open switch. Every time you have an open switch, you cannot tell what is the voltage just by looking at the switch. The voltage will be determined by the external circuit. In this case, the external circuit is an ideal current source, which is a component that doesn't exist and probably the only component that is not able to determine its own voltage. In reality, there will always be some other component that set the voltage. Most likely, the voltage will be zero volts. Second point, we might not have an exact voltage value if we use the simplified IV curve, but compared with the previous lesson, at least this is not a dangerous operating point. The diode is off, the current and the power are zero, so nothing is going to break. On the contrary, when you play with the voltage, when you force the voltage on the diode, if you make a mistake and the voltage happens to be a little bit too much beyond the threshold, you could have quite high currents because the curve is very steep and you might suddenly break the device. In this lesson, we will look at a much more realistic circuit. As you can see, in this circuit, we have the series of a resistor and a diode all in parallel to a voltage source. This is one of the most common ways that diodes are used in real life. We know that VCC is 3 volts, we know that the resistance is 200 ohm, and we also know that the threshold of the diode is 1 volt. And we want to find the voltage on the resistor, the voltage on the diode, and the current in the diode and the resistor. 
This time we will solve the circuit by using the equivalent circuits of the dial in the different region of operation instead of looking at its IV curve. In the previous examples, either the voltage or the current of the diode was known. Hence one only has to use the IV curve to solve the circuit. Because if you have one of them, and this is your IV curve, now representing the real one, once you have either the voltage or the current, you can always find the other one using the IV curve. In this case though, due to the presence of the series resistor, Neither the voltage nor the current are known, but they need to be derived somehow. As you can see here, we know that we have 3 volts on the series of the resistor and the diode, but we don't know how much of these 3 volts will go on the diode and how much will go on the resistor. Here is where using the simplified IV curve, or even better, equivalent circuits, helps speed up the study of the circuit. If you had to use the real IV curve or the real equation to solve this circuit, you would have to solve much more complex equation to get your result. Solving circuits with diodes require following a four-step procedure. Point number one, make an hypothesis on the operating region of the diode. Just by looking at the circuit, you can have a rough idea and try to guess whether the diode will be on, off or in the breakdown region. It doesn't matter which one you pick, it's an arbitrary choice. In point number two, you replace the diode with the corresponding equivalent circuit of the region of operation that you chose. In point number three, you now have a circuit without any diode, because all the diodes have been replaced with their equivalent circuit. So you can go ahead, solve the circuit, and verify that the voltage and the current on the diode are compatible with the chosen operating region. Finally, point number four, if the voltage and the current at the diode are compatible with the region of operation that you guessed in point number one, you are done. If not, change the hypothesis and restart from point number one. Okay, let's try to solve this circuit. Let's start with the assumption that the diode is off. So this is point number one. Point number two, if the diode were off, the equivalent circuit will be an open switch. So we delete the diode and OK, we can leave it like that. The circuit is open, so it's equivalent to an open circuit. Or if you want to make it better, we can actually draw the switch. Now, at this point, there's no more diode in the circuit. So we can easily solve the circuit using Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff laws. Because the diode was replaced by open switch, the current will have to be zero. So ID in this case will be equal to zero. But if ID is equal to zero, VR will also be equal to zero. Now, if you apply the Kirchhoff voltage law, it will be very easy to determine that if VR is equal to zero, VD has to be equal to three volts. Now, point number four, let's verify our hypothesis. Is the diode off if the voltage is equal to 3 volts in that direction and the current is equal to 0? The answer is no. The threshold of the diode was 1 volt. So with 3 volt in that direction, which is the right direction to turn the diode on, the diode will definitely be on. In conclusion, we started assuming that the diode was off, but after we had gone through all the steps of the process, and we have calculated what would be the voltage and the current through the diode if the diode were to be off in the circuit, we found out that those values of current and voltage were not compatible with the diode in the off region of operation. So that assumption was wrong and we have to start from scratch. Let's restart from point number one and this time we assume that the diode is on. If the diode is on, the equivalent circuit of the diode will be a voltage source equal to 1 volt, where the potential is higher at the anode. So let me delete the open switch and we replace with a voltage source equal to 1 volt. It's easy to see, using the Kirchhoff voltage law, that the voltage on the resistor has to be 2 volts now. 
You can see that the diode and the resistor are in series, so 2 plus 1 is equal to 3, which matches with the voltage source that is in parallel. Now, if the voltage on the resistor is equal to 2 volts, and the resistor is equal to 200 ohm, that means that ID will be equal to 10 million. Is this condition compatible with the diode in the on region of operation? Yes. When the diode is on, the voltage at its terminal is equal to 1 volt, which is the threshold of the diode, and the current has to be positive going from the anode to the cathode. Just like in this case, we have 10 milliamp going down and crossing the diode from the anode to the cathode. We have completed the study of the circuit. Notice how it is the combination of the voltage source and the resistor that determines the value of the current in the diode. The diode is simply either off and forcing a zero current or on and forcing one volt. The current is determined by the external circuit. This is how the current was calculated, in fact. Vcc minus V diode divided by R is equal to the current in the diode. You take Vcc, which is the overall voltage, you remove the drop on the diode, so then you're left with the voltage on the resistor, you divide with the resistor and you find the current in the resistor, which is also the current in the diode. This is the way the diodes are used most of the time. You turn on the diode by providing a voltage that is higher than its threshold. In this case, the circuit is able to provide a 3 volts, which is higher than 1, so most likely it's going to be able to turn on the diode. And then you place a resistor in series to the diode to fix the current to a desired level. In this lesson, we will study a particular type of diode called light emitting diode or LED for short. LEDs are a type of diode that emits light when a current flows through them. LEDs are operated in a very similar way to standard diodes. The only difference is that when they are in the on region of operation and there is a positive current going from the anode to the cathode, LED will emit some visible light with a different color depending on the type of LED. LEDs are widely used for traffic signals, automotive, indications in electronic devices, and in recent years, they have also become more and more popular as outdoor and indoor illumination sources thanks to their higher efficiency and longer lifetime. LED come in different packages and form. A few examples are shown in this slide. Here you can see surface mounted LEDs used in LED strips for illuminations. This is another example of surface mounted LED used to signal the presence of power on a circuit. These are classic through all red LEDs. Finally, on the right, I show the internal design of a through all LED, like the red ones that I've just shown. Differently than with regular diodes, the way the cathode is distinguished from the anode is via the flat spot on the component package. This region here. Additionally, when the LED is new and its lead have not been cut yet, the cathode can be distinguished by its shorter lead. As you can see here, here you have one component. If you look at this one, you will notice that one of the lead is shorter. This will be the cathode. Let's try to understand how light can be created in LEDs. On the left, we have a circuit composed by a voltage source in parallel with the series of a resistor and an LED. Note that the symbol of the LED is the same as the symbol of a diode, just with two extra arrows to indicate that it's a component that emits light. The voltage source generates 5 volt. The LED requires 2 volts in order to operate, so the remaining 3 volts is falling across the resistor. The current is equal to 20 milliamp. At the beginning of the course, we learn that voltage is a representation of the electrical potential energy of the charges per unit of charge. Let's think of what an imaginary positive charge will do in this circuit. The positive charge will start the journey here with a very high energy, indicated by the 5 volt. Then, as the charge proceeds towards the opposite side of the voltage source, it will lose 3 volts worth of energy crossing the resistor, and finally, it will lose 
the last two volts voltage of energy crossing the LED. You might have heard that there is a thing called the principle of conservation of energy, which is a very important principle, which states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can only transform from one form to another. And we've just seen that the positive charge started with a very high energy out of the voltage source, but then it lost all the energy crossing the circuit. So the question is, where does the energy go? The energy lost on the resistor converts into thermal energy, which means that the resistor's temperature will increase. The energy lost on the LED converts into two forms of energy. A small part of the energy is converted into thermal energy, which will also cause the diode temperature to rise. The designer of the component will try to minimize this contribute as much as possible. The remaining part of the energy is converted into light emitted from the diode. The higher is the portion of the energy A typical IV curve for a Zener diode. And I also show here the new schematic symbol for this component. It's very similar to the one of the standard diode, it just had two little legs at the cathode. 
like this. Looking at the AV curve, we can see that the on and the off region are very similar with the standard diode with a forward or threshold voltage between 0.3 and 0.7 volts. The big difference is in the breakdown region. With a standard diode, the breakdown region starts for very high negative voltage, whereas with a Zener diode, we have much lower voltages. For example, minus 4.3 volts in this case. Because of the low breakdown voltage, and because of the way they are designed, Zener diodes can be operated continuously in the Zener region without suffering any damage. So you can bias the device to have a negative current here, for example, corresponding to a certain voltage, and you can keep the device in that point of work indefinitely. In this slide, we see a typical application of a Zener diode. Very often, Zener diodes are used to generate relatively constant voltage from a variable source and for a variable load. Let's see how it works. Let's look at the circuit on the right. It's easy to see that if the voltage of the battery is high enough, that is, higher than the Zener voltage of the Zener diode, the diode will be in the Zener region of operation, because a current with this direction will be forced through the device. The key of the circuit is to dimension the resistor so that the diode is properly biased in its Zener region of operation. You don't want to bias the device right at the knee, somewhere here, because you're not really in the Zener region of operation, but you want to bias it deep into the breakdown region, where the curve is so steep that the device is actually behaving like a voltage source. At the same time, you don't want to use a current that is too high, because that will just drain the battery faster and heat up your components. Let's say that after consulting the data sheet, we figure out that the right amount of the current that we want is 50 milliamp. So we want to find where 50 milliamp is here. This is minus 50 milliamp. So that we want to bias our Zener diode in this point of operation. In order to do so, we have to design R to have a certain value. The voltage of the battery is 9 volts. And we'll try to get the Zener diode into the Zener mode. So when it will be in Zener region of operation, the voltage here will be 4.3 volts. So that tells me that the remaining voltage across the resistor will be 4.7 volts. And we said that we wanted to have a current that is 50 milliamp. So to get a current equal to 50 milliamp with 4.7 volts of drop, we need R equal to 4.7 volt divided 50 milliamp, which is about 94 ohm. So now that we know the value, we can cancel this, and we just say that R is equal to 94 ohm, and the current will be 50 milliamp. Let's indicate the current here, because that will be the current in the resistor. And the voltage across the diode will be 4.3 volts. And we succeeded in biasing the device in this point of operation. Now you can see how this application is quite good and generating a constant voltage equal to 4.3 volts, because now even if you connect a certain circuit afterwards, like here, the circuit in order to work is going to require some current, but as long as the current that is required by this device is not too high, let's say up to, we can call it maybe 30 milliamps, then we will still have a remaining 20 milliamp going to the diode, and we will still guarantee that the diode is crossed by a negative current in that direction, so the diode is in a Zener mode of operation with a voltage approximately equal to 4.3 volts. At the same time, you can notice this other thing, that even if the battery voltage drops as the battery discharge, the output voltage will remain constant, equal to 4.3 volts, as long as the drop across the resistor, which is Vbat minus 4.3 volts, is high enough, such as the current going through the device, it keeps the device in the Zener region of operation. 
the trick to use the Zener diode to generate a custom voltage is to design a circuit around it that guarantees that for all application conditions that you want to consider, there is always a minimum amount of current going through the diode to keep it in the Zener mode. For instance, in this example, the circuit forces a 50 mA current through the diode when the battery is full at 9 volts and there is no load. However, we have seen that as the battery discharge or if you connect something in parallel to the Zener, the amount of current to the component will decrease. So the point of work will move from here, it will go up, getting closer and closer to the end of the Zener region, where the curve is not as steep anymore. It is up to the designer to make sure that in all conditions the current never gets below a certain value, a certain limit, such as the operating point will stay in the steep part of the curve and the diode will keep a relatively constant voltage. In this lesson, we will discuss one of the typical applications of diodes, rectification. On the left, we have a circuit that is composed of an AC voltage source, a diode and a resistor. We decided to call Vin the voltage generated by the voltage source and we have represented it in a graph on the right. As you can see, the voltage Vin is sinusoidal, so it periodically switches between positive and negative. We also indicated in the max and the minimum value of the AC voltage is V peak and minus V peak. We will need this later to calculate the value of the current. We call V out the voltage on the resistor and we call ID the current in the diode. We also assume that the diode is ideal, meaning that its forward voltage when it's on is equal to zero volt. This helps simplify the study. This circuit is called half wave rectifier. And it will be easy to understand the reason of the name after we have solved the circuit. The goal of this circuit is to take an alternating current and convert it into a direct current. An alternating current is a current whose direction of flow changes with the time from positive and negative. If you imagine that we replace the diode with the short, like this, the resistor will be in parallel to the AC voltage generator, hence the current will continuously change between positive and negative. So the current will be something like this. Where the peak here will be equal to V peak divided by R. And this peak here will be equal to minus V peak divided by R as per Ohm's law. When the diode is added to the circuit, things change. So let's delete these markings.
positive and that means that the diode has to be on because a voltage larger than the forward voltage of the diode which in this case is zero volt is applied in the right direction between anode and cathode so the diode has to be on now that we understand when the diode is on and when the diode is off we can redraw the curves of the R and ID. So just to make it a little bit more clear, let's cancel ABC and let's just say on, off, and on. I delete the previous, the out, and let's update the graph. Okay, when the diode is off, V out will be equal to zero. So this is how it will look like. When the diode is on, V in will be equal to V out. So the output voltage will be exactly the same as the input voltage. Like this. As far as the current is concerned, when the diode is off, the current will be equal to zero as well. But when the diode is on, then we, you just have to solve the Ohm's law. The drop across the diode is zero volt, so the whole V in is going uh, across the resistor. So just as before, we are gonna have that the current will look like this. And where these points will be equal to V peak divided by R. As you can see, this circuit took an alternative voltage as an input and returned an output voltage and current that are only positive. Circuits similar to these are employed in many products to convert AC voltages, like the voltage in your home power network, to direct voltage that is required to run an electronic product. It's also easy to understand why the circuit is called halfway rectifier. If we compare the input and the output of the circuit, you can see that in a way the circuit got rid of half of the wave. The negative part of the curve of the input voltage has been eliminated and only the positive part was able to pass through the circuit. So the circuit is called half-wave rectifier. In this lesson, we will look at another important application of diodes. The schematic on the right is just a fraction of the overall schematic of the Arduino board, a famous open source electronic platform. Let's find each of the components on the board. First we see a big component called X1. This is a connector that you can see here on the board. Here is where you connect your jack to provide a 12 volt supply to the board. Then we have a diode D1, which is obviously here. Then we have two electrolytic capacitor, PC1 and PC2. And they're obviously here. This is PC1 and this is PC2. Then we have a small capacitor called C2, which is here. And finally, we have a chip that is used to convert 12 volts into 5 volts. As you can see, after this chip, the voltage has become 5 volt, which is called U1, and it is this component here. For the purpose of this lesson, we can forget about most of these components, and we can focus just on D1 and X1. So let me delete all these markings. So this one is X1 and this is D1. So what is the function of D1? Very simple. D1 is used to protect the circuit against connecting the power supply upside down. Note that doing this is really hard because the 12 volt receptacle and the corresponding jack are standard components and are keyed, meaning that you can only connect them in one way, the correct way. But let's say that the power supply that is connected to the jack is compromised and somehow the positive and the negative terminal got swapped. Now if you connect the power you will be providing minus 12 volt instead of plus 12 volt. This can break all the components on the circuit and you would find yourself with the bricked board. To protect against that the designer put a simple diode in series with a 12 volt power supply. Now if the voltage that is applied is negative the die will turn off and act as an open circuit, protecting the components downstream. So it will be like this, just like an open circuit or an open switch. No voltage is applied to the components that follow and no current can flow. So the board is protected. 
Conversely, when the voltage is positive, the diode turns on, behaves sort of like a short circuit or a closed switch, and the circuit is allowed to function. This application is called reverse polarity protection.